Hello, everyone. Welcome to our final session for the day at the steps at JLF Boulder. Uh, this session is uh, Yashodra. We have Vanessa Sasson and uh, Namita Gokhale uh, in conversation. Uh, but before we start the, co uh, this is this. Sorry, I'll start again. The session is presented by the Tibet Himalaya Initiative. And before we start the session, I'd like to invite uh, Holly Gailey to the stage to say a few words. Thank you. We have some exciting events coming up from the Tibet Himalaya Initiative. You're welcome to take um, a card for some of those. I'd like to highlight Lama Jop, who is going to be giving a lecture called An Act of Bardo, Translating Tibetan Verse, on Saturday, September 6th at 11 a.m., fifth floor of Norland Library, public event. All are welcome. What did I say? <laughs> Thank you, yes, October 6th, excellent Saturday. Um, Buddhist love stories are actually quite rare. There are at least two from 20th century Tibet that I have had the honor of, of researching, writing about, and translating from one of those. But this phenomena goes all the way back to the Buddha. And the Buddha, in his uh, Chronicles of Past Lives, the Jataka Tales, is, uh, his story is intertwined with Yashodara's, his wife over many, many lifetimes until, of course, the famous one in which he leaves her behind as he departs on his quest for enlightenment. So Vanessa Sasson has done an amazing job of bringing Yashodara's story to life for us. This is an immaculately researched work of hagiographic fiction. And um, today she is in conversation with Namita Gokale. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. So I hope you're all comfortable in your reasonably comfortable perches. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here with Vanessa because I was in conversation with her in Delhi some time ago about this book. And both of us got so deeply involved in the conversation that we actually forgot about the audience. <laughs> and uh, the audience seemed to enjoy that because they felt they were part of a very intense private conversation, which then they joined in. Um, before uh, I introduce Vanessa, I want to introduce my own intersection with Buddhism, because I am a Hindu, and you got to remember that the Gautam Buddha was a Hindu before he became a Buddhist, <laughs> or the first Buddhist. Uh, and. Uh, there are those in India who think that uh, he, uh, a lot of the Advait movement of those days was actually a form of neo-Buddhism, and the person who was described as the enemy of the uh, Buddha, Adi Shankaracharya, was a neo-Buddhist himself. And that really the Buddhist movement was a reform movement uh, within Hinduism, but which didn't, uh, it, although, Nepal and India are between them. Lumbini was the birthplace of uh, the Buddha, but it, it's not got the same resonance in India. It was chased away because it was a reform movement which threatened the hierarchies of Hinduism. And, and so uh, this wonderful book, Yashodhara, looks at a woman who was actually uh, born a Hindu and, and then became a Buddhist or whatever, as the story unfolds. She will read out a bit. So let me introduce um, the many accomplishments of Vanessa Sasson. She's a professor of religious studies in Marianapolis College in uh, Quebec. She's a research fellow for the International Institute for Studies in Race, Reconciliation, and Social Justice at the University of the Free State in South Africa. She's also a adjunct professor for religious studies at the Faculty of Religious Studies of McGill University, Montreal. And as a scholar, her interest is in books on Buddhist studies um, with a focus on gender and, and childhood. Her published books include The Birth of Moses and Buddha, a paradigm for the comparative study of religions. 
And then the edited volumes, Little Buddhas, Children and Childhoods in Buddhist Texts, which I know many of you will ask her about later. And also Imagining the Fetus and the Unborn in Myth, Religion, and Culture, which um, had a direct bearing also on Maya's dream before the Buddha was, when he was conceived. Her new book, Yashodhara, is the life of the young woman who was the friend, the wife, the queen of Prince Siddharth. Throughout history, there are gaps and silences around the lived lives of women. There's a sort of negative space around all that they have done and contributed to the fabric of life. The women in Indian scriptures, epics, and history tend to be marginalized in the valorization of the great gods and heroes of the time. Some of these stories are now emerging from the shadows. Many, many, many books are published every year in India, picking up figures who have been forgotten and giving them new life. There's Sita, on which um, I did a book some time ago, and now after that, there have been at least 12 books in the last few years. There was the patient Urmila. Kasturba, the wife of the Mahatma, is being looked at. Uh, to get a sense of Vanessa's interpretation and uh, telling of Yashodhara, I request her to do a short reading so that you can get a flavor of the book and maybe another reading in the end so that oh we'll, we'll see. Okay. Let's begin. Where, where do you plan to begin, Vanessa? I'll start at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Does this work? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming and sitting on, you know, less comfortable chairs and for coming at the end This of the is the day. Buddhist. This is the. <laughs> we did Miller Ripa here last year. <laughs> this is the Buddhist suffering room. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the book and then I'll read to you the almost beginning. I'll skip a part because last time what she didn't tell you is that um, our conversation was supposed to be an hour and I think we ended up being in that room for two hours and nobody left and nobody said anything and so we went for two solid hours. We won't do that today. So that's why, so I think I'll do a shorter reading this and we'll try yes. to keep a control on ourselves. Um, so what this book is, this book is a result of uh, probably my career's worth of research but not it's the culmination of probably what I've done so far in my research. Uh, the book itself was a focus for about five years. Um, and it's a retelling of her life story. But uh, the departure for me was to write it as a novel instead of writing it as an academic work. Uh, it's based on my academic research. It's based on many years of study. But when I sat down to write it, I thought that I just wanted to play. So, uh, I, and I was ready to let go a little bit of my training and see what would happen with the training deeply inside of me, but what can I do if I did something different? What kind of writing can I do other than what I've been so trained to do? So I tried to write her story um, in a fictionalized way for a more popular audience instead of kind of making arguments and describing her story from the outside. I kind of wanted to become her. Um, and when, actually I was listening to the session on biography um, earlier this afternoon, a lot of what the speakers said uh, really resonated for me of wanting to, you know, the question somebody asked at one point uh, in that session a question about, you know, did you like your character and what did you, how did you relate to your character? And I felt very attached to her and I felt like I needed to be with her the whole time that I was writing her book. She became really central. And somebody asked if you liked their characters and I, I wouldn't even be able to answer that question. It wasn't so much liking as just engaged with her. So it's not a like or a dislike, it's just uh, an embodiment almost of, I had to know what it felt like to be her. So I needed to climb into her world. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with the skeletal structure of her story, but she, um, I mean, a lot of people don't even know that she existed. Uh, the most common question that I've received over the years when I told people about this project was, the Buddha had a wife? <laughs> and, and I've had this question from, from like serious Dharma practitioners, I've had it everywhere. Um, from Asian Buddhists, from Western Buddhists, I've, I've really received this question quite often. So yes, he had a wife. Uh, and I think she was quite important. And as Heidi mentioned, she was there from the Jatakas, from her past lives. She was always with him. And so she was with him in the final life as well. And so I don't think she's a marginal, uh, unimportant wife who's just kind of the background to the great man. I think she was really quite important. Otherwise, she wouldn't return over and over. The story, as I'm sure all of you know, is that the Buddha was a prince living in his fabulous kingdom and then has this experience of suffering uh, and realizes he can't stay in the kingdom anymore. And so he has to go. And so he does his great departure and he you know, gets on his magical white horse called Kantaka, who's a deeply emotional character. 
and charges out of the palace gates and the gods swing open the door and the gods also catch his hooves as he's running out so that he doesn't make any noise so that nobody hears and everyone stays asleep. And he has this kind of fabulous departure into the night where he runs away from his kingdom. And so what we tend to know is that he ran away from the kingdom, but he also ran away from her. And some traditions say that he ran away from her the night that she gave birth to her son. There are different variants, there are different tellings of how the story goes. Buddhists are not unanimous as to how they tell their stories, but um, one of the common ways that the narrative is told is that he leaves her the day she gives birth. So it's as though he just needs to know the child is okay, I've done my obligation, and now I'm leaving. Um, the, the alternative is he impregnates her and then he goes. But um, I don't like that one. So <laughs> I've decided that she gives birth. <laughs> so, but it's very, very sad. Right? And then when he, he goes and he becomes the Buddha and he's fabulous because he's the Buddha. Um, and then eventually he comes back because the king has summoned him. And so I'm telling you all this because this is where the story, this is where I start the, the, the book. Um, I don't start it right with her beginning. I start at this moment. Is that the king asks for the Buddha to return. And uh, in my mind, he's asking for darshan. He's asking to have a moment of darshan with his son before the end of his own life. And so he actually sends... Uh, ministers to find the Buddha over and over again. And so one minister after another goes galloping off into the forest to find the Buddha, to request him to come back to see his father. And each time the minister just disappears and never comes back. So then the king sends the next minister and off he goes into the forest and never comes back. And depending on the text you read, it's either, you know, five or it's like 50,000 ministers <laughs> have disappeared. I feel like the entire kingdom has been emptied because everybody has gone off and nobody comes back. So because the texts get more you know, awesome as the time goes. Um, and they're all one-upping each other. They have to be better than the last version. So um, finally, Kaludayan uh, says to the king, I will bring him back if you permit me to then officially become a monastic and ordain under him. And so the king says, well, either way, you're going to disappear, so I might as well give you permission. <laughs> so Kaludayan says, okay, and he goes into the forest, and he finds the Buddha, and he says, you have to come back. And the Buddha says, okay. And so the Buddha returns. Um, and that conversation, actually, I'm just realizing now, that's another moment. There's a lot of moments that the texts assume but don't describe. And I'm just suddenly thinking, as a, you know, someone who would fictionalize the tradition, that that conversation between Kaludayan and the Buddha is a conversation that I would love to see written out. So he comes back, and there's different versions. Some he stays in a grove, and some he comes back to the palace. Everybody tells it differently. Um, I decided that he came back to the palace, because there's one version where he comes back to the palace, and she, everyone in the kingdom, comes to see the Buddha. And so they're all in the courtyard, and they're all worshiping at his feet. And they're bowing to this man that was once the prince and that now is the enlightened one. And the women are there, and the men are there, and the servants are there. It's just this incredible collection of people just so honored to see him. And he shines like the sun. She won't go. She goes to a balcony, according to one version, and she looks through the window, and she sees him. And she decides, if he wants to see me, he's going to have to come and find me. But I'm not going to see him. So she's the only one who refuses to go and get darshan from him. And to me, that is a really significant moment in the narrative because he still, there's a personal relationship there. He's not just some super transcendental Buddha. He's her husband, and he left her, and he made her a widow, which is what happens when somebody chooses a life of renunciation in traditional Indian society. The wife becomes a widow. He's socially dead. He no longer counts in society anymore. He has separated himself completely. And so she wears the clothes of a widow. And the tradition describes her all dressed in white. So she's mourning as a widow. She's abandoned as a widow. And now he's come back, and everybody celebrates. He's alive, but she's a widow. To me, this is just torture. So when I think of her story, I'm just in so much pain, because I think, how does this woman deal with this situation that her husband is alive, but he's dead, and she's a widow, and they're celebrating him, and they forget about her? And she's alone upstairs looking at him through a window. To me, it's just, it's, it's such an emotional moment. And it's, it's beautiful because it speaks to the humanity of his narrative. And so she refuses to go see him and she goes back to her room. And he, 
realizes he's in trouble. <laughs> and so he goes to see her. And to me, this is an amazing encounter because it means he also on some level must still be treating her as his wife. Because otherwise a man has absolutely no business going into a princess's room. There's, it's, it makes no sense that this man would enter her room privately. If he's a renunciant, he cannot be alone with her. As a man, she's not allowed to be alone with a man. Like on, on every kind of etiquette level, this doesn't fly. And yet he walks into her room to see her directly. And so the, to me, this means the bond is still there, that there's a, there's a romance with renunciation as though you, know, you renounce and everything's over and nobody feels anything anymore. But everything in the literature tells us and everything in human nature tells us, we don't operate this way. You can be a renunciant, but you're gonna still go see your parents when they're ill. And all, every monk I know does. This is human nature. I don't know any monastic in their right mind who would get a letter saying their parents are dying and say, oh, but they're not really my parents anymore. And it, it, it's not how people work. And I don't think it's how the Buddha functioned. I'm, it's blasphemous, but I, I really don't see human nature in any other, I can't imagine it. So he returns to see her, um, and then he does something terrible. He tells her that he's going to take his son with him. So now she has lost her husband, who's dead but alive, that everybody worships, that she's forgotten. She gave birth by herself, he left, raised her child alone for the last seven years, and he comes back only to tell her, I'm taking our son. It's time for him to become a monk. This is why her story needed to be told, is to me that, that her story is so sad. Right? And there's so much loss and there's so much humanity and there's so much reality of a woman's experience. And the tradition recognized that. The tradition didn't whitewash it. The tradition did not say he was perfect at it. I mean, the tradition does say he was perfect at every step of the way. Okay, they do that. But at the same time that they do that, there is this paradox in the literature of maintaining these scenes, which tells us that there's more complexity to the tradition than what we might want to paint. So how I started the book is with her, so this is another scene. There are many scenes that I realized as I was writing the book that the tradition tells you happened, but they don't describe. And one scene that I have not seen in any traditional narrative of the Buddha's life is the scene where she has to say goodbye to her son. I don't know any text that has described this, and so I realized this I'm gonna have to make up myself. Um, and incidentally, just for your information of how this book works, is because all of this is so sensitive, because religion is sensitive, excuse me, what I did at, with this book is at the end of the book, there are end notes, also because the scholar in me just can't let it go. Um, and so there's about 30 pages of end notes where I explain in every chapter, this comes from this text, this comes from this text, and this I made up. And that way you can track and decide if I made it up in a way that you agree, disagree, if you want to find out how the text is written in this particular, you, know, you can actually map the literature yourself. And you don't have to just take my word for it or wonder where did she get this from, it's all explained, which I thought would be helpful um, to readers. So I'm going to read to you um, how I start the book, which is with a prologue where she says goodbye to her son. Um, I resisted this for a long time, and then I realized that when you write a novel, it's not like writing academic stuff. You have to have like a hook. <laughs> Academics don't do hooks. Um, if we do, we're, it's not, it doesn't go well. So um, <laughs> I created a hook, and it starts with this very sad scene where she says goodbye to her son, and so the, it opens, I won't read to you the whole chapter, um, but it opens with her in her room alone with her maidservant, just sobbing in her bedroom saying, how could he do this to me? What kind of a husband did I have? That first he leaves me, and now he comes back to take my son, right? And it's her maidservant who had just met with the Buddha because she was downstairs um, in, the, in the courtyard who feels inspired and she has the courage to tell the princess, you can face this. This is what is being asked of you, therefore this is what you must do. So she pulls herself together and she goes downstairs to say goodbye to her son. So that's where we're at. So I'll read you that. And then I guess yeah. we'll just we talk. Ju no, we have a few questions. Oh, we're going to do questions. Which are okay. I, I have many things to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I walked carefully down the rounded marble staircase that led to the great hall. My trembling had subsided, but I was still a bit uncertain of myself. I held the golden handrail with one hand and I lifted my robes with the other so as not to slip. When I reached the bottom, I exhaled with relief. I could see bodies milling around in the courtyard ahead. Men dressed in orange rags moving around silently. 
ochre-colored shadows. I adjusted my braid one more time, smoothed out my white wrap, tightened my sash, and then I crossed the great hall to the courtyard with one objective in mind, to find my son. He was sitting by himself by the edge of the lotus pool. How are you, darling, I asked, as I sat beside him. He did not look up. His fingers were trailing through the water and between the flowers. A flock of black birds tore through the darkening sky, chasing the moon like lost souls. He didn't notice them either. The servants would start lighting the oil lamp soon and then everything would be different. Sweetheart? No response. Rahula, I whispered as I placed my hand on the softness of his little neck. Please look at me. He trailed his fingers a little while longer, making pathways through the water. A frog watched him from the safety of a lotus leaf. Eventually, he looked up. His beautiful eyes were filled with the emotions he could not speak out loud. I wanted to fall into them. My mind fled into the past without permission as images of him from over the years paraded before my eyes. When had he grown so tall? I placed a lock of hair behind his ear, as I'd done so many times before. But a moment later, I recoiled at the realization that soon his hair would be shaved off. He would be so different. He wouldn't really be my son anymore. How are you feeling, sweetheart? I asked, as I attempted to put the thoughts aside. He shrugged. I'm all right. Are you ready? I guess so. He turned towards the water again. Sweetheart, it's all right to feel a bit scared right now. You know you don't have to be so brave. He looked up at me. You know, I added, I'm scared too. At these words, all of his restraint melted and he threw himself into my arms. Oh, mother, I am scared. I don't want to go. He sobbed against my neck. He was trembling just as I had been a moment earlier. Every fiber in my being wanted to scoop him up and run away. Run from the men in orange robes who were forcing us into this separation. Run from the world that dictated such realities and called them wisdom. My baby was crying and I wanted to make his tears go away. I inhaled the sweet smell of him. I would have renounced the entire world to let him go, to hold on to him a little longer. But I would not renounce his future to satisfy my desires. Slowly, ever so carefully, I pulled us apart. My beautiful sweetheart, I whispered, I'm so sad. I cannot imagine living without you. I wiped away the tears that were dripping down my own cheeks now. But I won't hold you back. It is time for you to find your life. But I want to be with you, he exclaimed. I know. I want that too. But you will be with your father. He will take care of you. He looked past me to where the men were, his father sitting straight and elegant at the center. I don't even know him, he objected. Well, you will learn to know him. But what if he doesn't like me? That, my darling, is one thing I know you don't have to worry about, I said with a confident smile. You are impossible not to love, my beautiful Rahula. And your father is a good man, you will see. He wiped his tears, which I knew was a good sign. But if I never, what if I never see you again, mother, he asked, as he voiced an all too familiar fear. I believe we will see each other again. But if anything happens, I stumbled against the words and caught myself. Then I will see you in the next life. We will never be lost to each other, Rahula. Don't ever forget that. Men in orange robes approached. Are you ready, young master, asked one of them. Rahula searched my face, looking for permission. He is ready, I answered for him. Beautiful. Oh, I'm sorry, was that not loud enough? That's because you were reading, and yeah. sometimes it just, um, yeah. I'll make sure anybody can't hear her, put your hands up, and we'll get her talking louder. <laughs> um, well, tell us about your own introduction to Buddhism. Oh, my. Uh, was it a past life connection, or a karmic connection, or were you drawn by the purity of the religion? I mean, what was it that hmm. drew you so deep into Buddhist? Thought. I'm not used to answering that question in public. <laughs> um, no, just uh, yeah, no, briefly, no. as much as you want to, because we have many more questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> that I know. I'm happy if you keep it brief, because I know there are so many questions from the audience. I, I don't want to step into those. Let's say it's a past life connection. Hmm? Let's just say it's a past life connection. We'll do it there. <laughs> okay. 
You've mentioned um, in your introduction that the inspired account of Yashodhara's life has come out of the playfulness of my mind. Um, how much of it is history, how much myth, how much fiction? Where how have you blurred the lines? And uh, why did you ultimately choose fiction mm. to tell the story? And of course, uh, I have seen the end notes and the research. So w what was the scaffolding of the story and what was the spirit of the story? Well, uh, in terms of like where I was at personally Mike. to write this, can you hear me? I'm, yeah. Um, part, a little bit of what I was saying before, that there's, uh, I wanted to see what else I could do. Uh, part of it was, uh, and I used this example in a talk uh, earlier, uh, a couple days ago, that I felt often as an academic uh, that I'm always on the outside looking in and that what I wanted to do was go inside. Uh, and so the, the example that always rings in my mind about this is that I felt like I was watching people dance and studying as people danced, but I wasn't actually dancing myself. And it dawned on me that that was an odd way to spend my life. <laughs> so I just wanted to try and see what would happen if I tried to participate in the tradition and not always stand outside of it. Um, but, what I, but I say this not as a critique of the academic process, but as a way of realizing that it was the academic process that taught me how to do that. That it's by questioning all the time the tradition that I realize there's another way to question it. Um, there is a Talmudic saying that you, the, with, the, with the Bible, that the rabbis used to look at the Bible and say that you have to turn it over and over and over again because you're never finished with it. So no matter how often you study the Torah, you have to turn it around again because everything in the world is in it. So just keep turning it. There's a similar saying in the Mahabharata that everything is in the Mahabharata, so that you're never finished with it. And so this idea that if you turn the tradition around, if I turned his story around and I looked at it from a different standpoint, if I stood inside and became the story instead of standing outside of it, what would happen, what would I learn? And that's what I wanted to do. So I wanted to know what more could I do, but I also wanted to know what would happen if I stepped in it and I wasn't outside of it. And that's, that was very much the reason why I did what I did with this book. Um, there are two questions I want to ask you, and I don't know which one comes to you first of the okay. two. One is, I'd, I'd like to know more about Prince Rahula's relationship with his mother, as you visualized it. But also, okay, first you go with this, and then we'll go with the next okay. question. Okay. Well, so this is another missing piece in the tradition, is that the tradition doesn't tell, the tradition tells her story. So you find Yashodara in the literature, wherever she's relevant to the Buddha. So if she has a scene to play with him, then the story's gonna play itself out. But wherever he's not there, she's not there. And so this is a real, um, we, and, and it's natural. They were really focusing on the Buddha, and so everybody else is playing their side parts, and when they're not playing their side parts, we're not paying attention to them. So it's a very normal thing for the tradition to do. But when you try to tell her story, you realize how many pieces are missing to her narrative. And so the tradition will tell you this dramatic story of her looking at, you know, her, her husband who's dead but alive sitting in the courtyard and then her, you know, crying hysterically in her room. That they will tell you the story of. But they don't tell you what it was like for her to give birth. This is something that the tradition did not describe. How did she give birth to her son? Who was there? How did it go? Who took care of her? Zero. What was she like as a mother? How did she relate to her son? Right? What, what it was her experience? They don't tell us. So this is where I realize probably, I think it's a safe bet that many of the authors of this literature were men who were used to telling men's stories. And even if they caught moments of women's lives, they didn't go down that road very often. They didn't explore it. So they would touch on it, they'd have moments, but it wasn't what necessarily most authors seem to have ever been interested in. So as a woman reading this literature, I'm like, but hold on a second. There's all these parts that I'm missing, the silent moments in the literature. And the thing that they don't tell us anything about is what kind of mother was she? How did she say goodbye to her son? How did she raise her son? So I had to imagine it. Um, and I imagined her, uh, it's probably a Western projection, but I don't even think so. Um, I wrestled with this for a while, but I imagined that if she knew her husband was going to leave her, and then she wakes up the next morning and he's gone. She couldn't have been in a good space after giving birth to him. So I certainly imagined a kind of depression that happened, a po what we would call in modern times uh, postpartum depression, and that she would have had a very hard time becoming a mother because it was equated with the moment of loss. 
And I think that's a very natural experience. I think a lot of women have experiences of loss when they birth a child. Because with something gained, there is something lost. And I think she's perpetually experiencing that. So I, I, I imagined her struggling with motherhood and then finally coming into it, only to have it taken away from her. But that's my imagination. I have no idea. So I want to share something which may not be immediately relevant, but which struck me just now. Yeah. When I was growing up, the name Rahul mm. was considered unlucky because people said Rahul means yeah. the ruddy one. So the red one, the red colored one, it's, it's a attribute. But people would say, I, I remember somebody in the family saying, I think I'll name my child Rahul. And they said, never, because Rahul was such an unfortunate name <laughs> and he had such an sure. unfortunate life because his father left him. And then it all changed because the last prime minister, uh, Indira Gandhi had a son called Rajiv Gandhi, and Rajiv's son was called Rahul. And it just struck me, Rahul lost his father very young. Oh. He was a young child when his father was assassinated, and there were these pictures of Rahul uh, at the funeral pyre when he was about 14, being very brave. And then it struck me while talking to you, I mean, it's about how stories persist and have their own cycles yeah. in India, that we have a prime minister called Mr. Narendra Modi. And uh, Narendra Modi got married when he was very young. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 19, he abandoned his wife, who was, he's still married to her. He never got a divorce. He just left home and became, in fact, a bit of a wandering monk with the RSS. And his wife was called Yashoda. Really? Yes. And it just struck me today. <laughs> and her, wow. her life is so much in parallel because oh everywhere in public she says she has nothing but respect for her husband. But he hasn't seen her. Her husband is the prime minister of India. She has security guards in her house, oh which intrude into her life because she always has to make them cups of tea and <laughs> things like that. But she, I feel like so, I don't want to equate the Buddha with Modi. No. no. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I know, I'm just kidding. I know, but I, I, I would not do that. But I am saying these tropes of exile, of abandonment. Yes. And in fact, these, ex is there something gone wrong with the lights there? Oh, good. Okay. okay. So, Exile is a theme in um, Indian uh, yes. myth throughout, and uh, you have the story of Sita, yes. who was exiled and who then was abandoned by her husband, but for different reasons. And uh, so uh, there is a scene in this book where it is from actually from the Ramayana, where Yashodhara watches a 10-day rendition of the Ram Leela, which is the story of Ram, at the royal court. And she is startled and shocked by the treatment of Surpanaka, who was a demoness who was in love with Ram and uh, who took on a beautiful or so-called human form. And uh, her nose was dismembered by... And her breasts were cut and her, off. It's well, it's, yeah? yes. Her, well, it's, I, I only read the oh, nose. No, no, it's the breast. But, and so it's in a way <laughs> her own abandonment that even you've taken another aspect of another epic yes. and you've mm -hmm. picked up a story which is somewhere disrespectful or disregarded disregarding of women's dignity, of their um, emotional sanctity, and you've put it as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So uh, was that, I mean, of course it was yeah. deliberate, but tell us more about this. No, it was, it was very, I mean, part of it, and I say it in my end notes, uh, David Shulman, who's an old friend, he came, he, he spends his career looking at Kudiyatam. And he came to Miguel one day and gave a talk that I went to go listen to where he described this scene. So I say in the end notes that this is from his description. He just completely overwhelms me when he described the scene that he saw in Kudiyata. I mean, he had clips of it and pictures of it. And it was so haunting and beautiful. A Surpanaka is so wronged. And she's so invisible. She's just irrelevant. And I'd never connected to Surpanaka in that way until I heard David talk about it the way he did. And I was so moved by it. And I thought, again, here's this woman who is put to the, and again, it's this heroic, right? It's, it's Ram who's the great hero. He's the perfect king. He's the ideal everything. And he treats her terribly. And, and it's, treat, it, it's treated like an act of valor. Well, and he's throwing her to Lakshmana. Lakshmana says, I don't want her. And he throws her back. And they go back and forth. And she's so hurt. And then she becomes the demoness. And I think this pattern of 
you know, heroic men and these women who are invisible. I just want to know, when is somebody going to tell Surpanaka's story? We have told it. In oh, you, if you, it's in that book. In that book, there is, uh, it's an anthology. And oh, that's right. there's a story by Amit Chaudhary, which is uh, one awesome. of the most beautiful stories um, I've yeah. ever read. So, uh, as I said earlier, um, Hinduism was caste-ridden, hierarchical, and uh, Jainism was one sort of reform movement, which was not really, but in some senses. But many people think that Buddhism was the first reform movement uh, within um, a, a living tradition. But um, how come that all, at, th at that time, Mo women could be ordained as nuns, and this was an improvement on what happened in uh, the, in Hinduism, where the old um, matriarchal religions had been uh, extinguished um, quite ruthlessly. But um, I'm told when I go to Bhutan and when I uh, study these matters that nuns suffer discrimination and that indeed the concept of nirvan is reserved only for those who are born as men. And uh, you cannot, unless you are reborn as a woman, uh, as a man, if you are just, if your last life is as a woman, you cannot achieve nirvan. And that, in fact, having a penis is, is the necessary, uh, uh, whatever, appendage <laughs> to, to, to getting. Uh, so this is how we ended up in a two hour conference. I'm just putting it out there right now. <laughs> So what are your personal views on the Buddha's views on gender? Because, in fact, um, as we discussed last time, he was reluctant to even take on women as nuns initially. And that was um, pushed, as you told the story so well. And through the centuries, how Buddhism has treated ma womankind. Where in its moral universe is both Yashodhara and women in general as a gender entity, where are they located in Buddhism? Because I've had many conversations on this, mm -hmm. and there is some extent of hurt, and because everything is so serene and nirvana-like, that hurt is not addressed. Yeah. Um, so my first answer will be the same as last time. So Wait, they I, have a Okay, no, well, my first answer is requires a whole semester. <laughs> it's a really big question, but I know it's really important to you, and it's an important question to address. Um, so just to sh where it connects to the book, uh, for those of you who don't know how her story ends, uh, and I was struck by, uh, I don't know if she's here, Ruby Lal, who, sa who was talking about her book, uh, is that she couldn't kill her character at the end. Um, and so the end of her book on uh, Noor Jahan it doesn't end with it. She just couldn't let her die. Um, I couldn't follow her into awakening, never mind die. Like I just, none of that was possible for me. So where I end the book, uh, so she goes through this whole process of, um, you know, she grows up, she marries the Buddha, it's a real love story, it's a very romantic wedding. Um, they're together, they experience things together, they debate with each other. This is another thing that I put in the book that uh, is not in the literature at all, uh, but I decided if she was his partner, he must have had conversations with her, he must have had, if anyone would have been the person to talk to, it would have been her, and she would have had a different perspective. So I have him debating with her, I have them arguing. There's a fight scene um, that I put in there that came so naturally, partly because I'm Egyptian. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, arguing is just very natural to me, and she had to argue like an Arab. Um, <laughs> so she does, and they have a big argument because I just figured they must have argued because they'd been together for lifetimes and it wasn't just as you're saying, this nirvana like everything's wonderful and she's just happy to love him. Um, and then her heart's broken and he leaves. And she struggles and then he takes her son. Um, so I'm giving you the total spoiler here, like you're getting that, there's just, <laughs> but I figure most of you know, like, so. Uh, and then she has to make her, like she loses through the book. She loses piece after piece. Like it's this, I felt like I was peeling an onion and each piece was hurting. You know, it was just one thing after another was happening to her. And she just kept trying to hold on and things kept being taken away from her. And she kept trying to remake a life and then something else would happen. And so to me it was really sad because they were such partners but they're misaligned. And so she's not ready to go when he's ready to go. And so he leaves her, and she's left behind, and her son is gone, and she's left behind, and she finds herself at the end of the book wandering around in the palace, not sure what to do with herself. 
everything's done for her. She doesn't have to cook. She doesn't have to go get wood from a forest, find water from a well. Her feet are oiled every night. Like, what does a princess do living in a palace with her in-laws, without her husband, without her child? Like, I just can't imagine anything more isolationist than this experience of hers. Um, I did make evil in-laws, even though that's a trope. I decided that that's not something I was going to do. So they're lovely, but it's not her family, and her family's gone. Her parents die, and so she's very alone. And the only person that's left is this character to, to connect to what you're saying, is Mahapajapati, who is the queen, um, and she is the Buddha's stepmother. And eventually the king dies, and she finds herself also a widow. But instead of feeling like everything's lost, she feels freer and freer. And Yashodara looks at Mahabajapati sailing through the corridors in her white outfit, and she looks much better in it than, you know, than she feels in it. And she, she sees the presence of a woman that's very different. And so one day Mahabajapati comes to see Yashodara and says, and this is part of the tradition, uh, it's time to go. And so I have them having a conversation that's not in the literature, but Mahapajapati does decide that there's nothing left for her in the palace anymore. And so she's going to go to the forest and ask the Buddha um, for rites of ordination for women. And precisely because of your question, because I'm so aware of the plight of nuns in parts of the world, I have her ask this question that I just needed to ask, where Yashoda says, but how can you do that? They're all men out there. And she says, so? <laughs> and she says, but they're going to say no, <laughs> like you can't, which is, this, which is the tradition. So her anxiety of you can't as a woman do this, and Mahapajapati saying, but I'm going to do this. And she says, if you want to come, you can come. And the book ends with her following her into this. She decides by the next morning there's nothing left for her. So she goes into renunciation because her life is finished. But I couldn't follow her into the forest because I can't imagine that part of the story because it's not something I can relate to because I don't understand it because I don't have any experience that I can, I can't imagine awakening. I mean, I just can't. There's no way I'm going to do it. So it ends there. Um, and there was a review in one newspaper in India. I don't know if you saw it. No. Oh, they were so mad at me that I ended it there. They <laughs> tore me. They were, how could you do this? She was an Arhans. You're supposed to say that she was awake. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. But um, Mahapajapati, the story that I don't tell, but that continues is they do go to the forest and they do ask the Buddha for rites for ordination. And Mahapajapati is the spokeswoman. And uh, the Buddha says no three times. And according to the Pali tradition, there are different accounts of this, but the Pali tradition, which gets quoted quite a lot, is that she said, the Buddha says, it's not a good idea that you ask me this question. And she says, okay, but can we be ordained? <laughs> and he says, Still not a good idea to ask me this question. And, you know, India, three times. You know, if somebody offers you food, you're allowed to, three times they're going to try, and then you got to, that's it. So third time, you know, can I please be ordained? And he says, it's not a good idea that you ask me this question. But she had done something very bold. And this is where women were more powerful. I think you just have to catch the details. She left the palace and did not show up in her royal garb. She left the palace, shaved her head, and came in robes. This, to me, is the most striking thing that Mahapajapati did because it means that she was kind of saying, I'm ordained anyway. <laughs> because she can't go back bald, right? So she already did it. She was just kind of technically saying, can make it happen. But she was basically telling him, which I think is such an extraordinary thing. And then he said, no. Which is just, this is where, again, you're just like, what is he doing? And so she, does, she has nowhere to go now because she's already renounced. She's cut off her head. She can't go back, but she has nowhere to go. So she goes to the back of the monastic community, and she, Ananda finds her there crying, just like she doesn't know what to do. I don't love that she's crying. That kind of is a, I wish the woman would not be crying, but anyway. Um, and so Ananda says, uh, what's happening? And she tells him what happens. So the Buddha then goes uh, to see, uh, Ananda goes to see the Buddha. And he says, I have a question for you. And so this is the first answer to your question. And he said, yeah. And he says, are women capable of achieving awakening exactly like men? And the Buddha's answer is, yes. OK. He says, is there any difference between a woman's awakening and man's awakening? No. 
They are absolutely equal in their capacity. So then Ananda says, so why is your stepmother back there crying? The one who fed you and nursed you and took care, why is she back there abandoned by you? And he says, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so he says, tell her to come back and she comes back. So this, the tradition is unequivocally clear, clear. Women and men are equally capable of achieving awakening, but, but, but. Then he says, you really want to be ordained? And she says, yes. And he says, then you have to agree to extra rules that the men don't abide by. And he, she says, okay, what are they? And the first rule is, now you know that hierarchy is everything. Um, in religious communities, in Buddhism, who's ordained first matters. So your birthday, once you're ordained, is the year that you were ordained. And so if you've been ordained, if you're 100 years old, but you've been, or, or, <clears throat> if, you, if you've been ordained 20 years, you're older than someone who's been ordained 15 years, even if you're biologically younger than that person. Your ordination age matters more than your biological age. And he says that if, you're, if a woman is ordained 100 years and a man is ordained a minute, he is superior to her. So we have a little problem. <laughs> Buddhism has a bit of a glitch. <laughs> but and this has all kinds of manifestations in the community. I, I think this will not be complete unless you tell us a little bit about Yashodhara's ordination. So then he... We don't I mean, know. We don't She's know. with Mahapajapati. Yeah. So whatever Mahapajapati accepts is what is true. So 500 women go with Mahapajapati. And she's one of them. And she's one of the, the 500 women. So she's part of this who, if they want the ordination, have to accept yes. these rules of inequality between the men and the women. What an intense story you've given us and uh, so many learnings. I think we should sure. now get some questions in at this moment rather than a reading because... Yeah, no, no, I agree. Hi. Um, Do I'm tell us your name. And I'm uh, Val, Valerie Fletcher. Um, this may be off subject a little bit, so if so, mm. you can tell me. Um, there are two separate things. One, the tradition of sati, of uh, burning the widow. And the other, I'm really interested in the Adi Shankara that you mentioned and that lineage and whether or not there was resistance to Buddha coming out of India from that Adi Shankara lineage. So they're two separate questions. So you want me to answer those? Or do, do you have, because no, you, go ahead. No, you may, uh, the Adi Shankara Charya will answer. If you, you have any, answer sati? if you feel that, if you know more, <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, well, a sati is a really complicated, um, loaded, messy subject. To, I wouldn't want to give it like a five minute presentation. It's quite off topic from what this we're subject. doing. But I'd be very happy to talk to you about it afterwards. It's a really yes. important topic to understand. I think that's true because it'll reflect from the uh, I think it's train of it. But yeah. on Adi Shankaracharya, because uh, at a time when Hinduism was what I think of it as a reform movement, where there was compassion and where the role of the Brahmin was reduced at the time of um, the Shank uh, with the Buddha's teachings. So they didn't really, the, the Hindu priests didn't like the fact that they were now redundant because if a prince could become also the leader of the spiritual movement, then what was the role of the priest? of the Hindu priest. Uh, it was a dangerous uh, anarchy for them. So the Adi Shankaracharya, who I think was the greatest, one of the greatest spiritual leaders of India, and also a great poet, started something called the Digvijay, which was an attempt to throw Buddhism out of India. And Buddhism did, was left India in a mean and violent way. And uh, uh, I, uh, my fellow Hindus don't like it when I say this, but uh, somebody just written a great book on Shankaracharya, and um, a friend of mine, Pavan Varma, and we, we, I was in conversation, when I brought it up, they sanitize it, and they say, oh, no, not at all, and all that. But there is a f no doubt that um, Buddhist temples were raised, even in my hometown and the mountains, there are places which are now Hindu temples. You can make sure they were, because meat is served there, and the monks were asked to marry the this animal sacrifice was the thing that was, um, didn't go with the Buddhist traditions. So I think there are other people keen to ask this, so I'm happy to talk about it more. 
but it was uh, uh, Adi Shankara Acharya was called by a Buddhist scholar whose name I cannot at the moment recollect, a Japanese gentleman. He's called him the greatest enemy of Buddhism. Oh. And he's also the greatest hero of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And the two faiths do coexist, so it's not. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Uh, oh, there is somebody with the mic uh, behind you. Hello. <laughs> you are in queue. <laughs> uh, one, one second. <laughs> You'll be after that. You just hand the mic down to her. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, you said you wanted to see what it was like from the inside out and see what you would learn. What are some of the things you learned from stepping inside and communicating outward? That's a great question. I think... Um, I think probably the most potent thing that I learned, I don't think I'd ever connected as much to how sad her story was until I tried to tell it, because I knew it theoretically. But then to really kind of, you know, uh, Namita, we were talking about this morning of when you're writing a novel and you're in it and you can't get out of it yes. because the characters are so real. Like, I mean, I remember going to bed at night and they were swimming in my head and I'd wake up in the morning and there they were again. Um, which was kind of a crazy experience. I've never had that as an academic. Um, it's true. <laughs> but that's the thing is I never had that as an academic. So I learned so much as an academic. So I don't want to in any way discount that. But when I tried to imagine them and, and, and embody the characters, they became alive to me in ways I'd never really dealt with before. And I don't think I knew as well as I feel I know now um, that her story is one of profound suffering. And that by telling her story, I think it's... Uh, it's an embodiment of the tradition. The tradition is about suffering. And as he's trying to find the answer to suffering, she is suffering. And I don't think we've ever really put that together in our conversation in Buddhism. You know, so the, that I think is probably the most important thing that I felt I connected to. Um, and I, I want to say her name almost, you know, like I want to recognize that. There was, I gave a talk in Mumbai at one point uh, to a mostly uh, ex-Dalit community. Uh, so these are uh, ex Dalits, uh, untouchable caste, who become Buddhist. Uh, it's a long, complicated history also. Uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to meet with them and to talk with them about the book. But what was really interesting was there was a lot of resistance to me telling, to do, kind of having the same conversation. And I wasn't quite sure what was happening until finally one woman said, listen, we became Buddhists because we're trying to get away from suffering. And you're putting suffering right back into the story. And I don't want that. And I said, well, then I, fair enough. <laughs> don't, don't read the book. Like, just, <laughs> you've got other work that you've got to do, so get away from this. But um, it was a very moving thing. And it was also that sense that there's, the suffering is kind of always around there. And it's in her. You know, it's not just him theoretically trying to work it out. You, you, in the book, you also, sorry to interrupt for a minute, but in the book you mentioned their childhoods and their birthdays were, the, the birth dates were, no? Okay. Are you talking about the ordination of Rahula? Or the no, no, I'm talking about Yashudara. And her childhood, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Well, a lot of that I had to imagine because that's not in the literature. So I did have to imagine that. Okay. Yeah. I think there's an impatient lady there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm in my head trying to understand um, Buddha's mother and his mythical birth and how much honor and tradition behind that and how she was revered and yet Buddha's wife, why was she not given some kind of a, a well, position? Well, actually the Buddha's mother is not really revered. Yeah. She's idealized. She's perfect. And she's nowhere. <laughs> she's dead. <laughs> um, no, but I'm being very serious. She's, she is literally escorted off the stage the moment she's fulfilled her function. So she gives birth to the Buddha, and seven days later, she's gone. And she doesn't achieve awakening. She doesn't benefit from the tradition. She is just gone. And there are virtually no temples I can think of only two places in the world that I've ever heard of or that I've seen myself uh, that have any kind of honoring to her. Uh, and one, and they're both actually in Nepal, uh, one is in Patan, and it's, but it's not even a temple. It's just a, you don't walk into it. It's just, it's a thing. 
standing there and there's a picture, there's a little you know, image of her giving birth to the Buddha. You know which one I'm talking about. Um, and then there's in, in uh, Lumbini Grove, but she's really not. She's and not, her dream remains. The, yeah, but the, 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 the honoring dream. of her in the history, she's nowhere yes. near Mary. Let me just say, Catholic Mary wins on all fronts, <laughs> right? But she's, she's nowhere. Mahapajapati is honored. Mahapajapati is the queen of the nuns. And so she's oh, really, really? Oh, she's really loved and, and she's a very important character for the monastic community because she is the heroic woman who stepped forward and said, give us ordination. And she fought for it and she got it. So she is a character that gets a lot of recognition. But Yashoda doesn't and Maya doesn't. So is there a book on Mahapajapati coming? There's many coming? books. About, oh, me? Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> There's a question there. Yeah, uh, this I mean actually, and I want to know a little more about Sujata, you know, <laughs> because is that myth or was it reality or is it just some sort of a made-up fiction story? You know about him taking the first grain of rice after his fast. Um, well, so if you're asking me whether any of this is myth or reality, is that your like is. Or do you mean just specifically, like, are you assuming that the Buddha's life story is based on historical fact? No, no, I'm talking about Well, yeah, but, uh, so the whole, uh, the question is, the, the reason I'm asking this, I'm kind of talking into the nowhere, I can't see anything, <laughs> yeah. so I feel like I'm just talking into space. But um, somewhere out there is a voice, and um, so I feel bad saying this because I can't even see your face, and I don't know if I'm going to upset you, but, oh, there you are. Okay, now I can know if I'm going to upset you. There's... <laughs> All right, well, hold on. <laughs> there's, no, there's no real reason to think that anything of the Buddha's story is historical fact. So Sujata is just another part of it. So far as we know, material evidence doesn't exist of the Buddha from his time period. It's a very specific sentence, right? There is evidence of Buddhism within a few centuries after when we know, we, we think the Buddha may have lived. But if we're going to be precise, there's no archaeological material evidence of anything having to do with the Buddha. So Sujata is right in there with everybody else. But that being said, the story of Sujata as a legend is part of the story who may have existed. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying academically I cannot verify that he did. Um, Sujata's story is certainly an important part of the story, and it's a very special part of the story. Yeah. Um, in the beautiful reading you did in the beginning, you alluded to Rahul's fear of whether his father would like him and what his life would be like afterwards. Is there any information about what happened to him? Oh, yes. How his life was as a... It's very, very limited. They don't spend much time on him either, which is an unusual... I don't know why, but the literature... Um, Mike. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if it's because the authors were as equally uninterested in children as they were in women. <laughs> I'm being serious. I think there may, be, there may be that because there's virtually no stories about Rahula. He does become an arhant. He does become awakened. He becomes an important part of the East Asian tradition as one of the great arhants um, of the, the Mahasiddhas. But the legends about him are quite limited. And there's not that many stories. There's not many stories about him. So we'd have to really fill up a lot of space to try to figure out what it was like to be raised by the Buddha in the forest. And did he ever meet his mother again? Well, because she goes, I would imagine they interact. But again, those are all the, the scenes that we would assume are there, but that, that are not told by the tradition. The tradition tends to focus on scenes where the Buddha is present. Where the Buddha is not present, the story is not told. So that's where I think that as a vibrant world that is engaged with its imagination, we have a lot of space to imagine stories that have yet to be told and that deserve to be told because I think the tradition is so much larger and can keep growing. And so I think there's an invitation in the tradition to keep imagining yes. the narratives. Buddhism is not limited to one text. There are thousands of texts that are considered to be authentic Buddhist, you know, Buddha Vachana, stories of the Buddha, you know, the Buddha's voice, his truth, his, what he said. The, the, the library, the canon is unending. So I see no reason why we can't continue imagining and adding scenes that are missing. And I think that's a scene that's missing. Uh, hi. Uh, 
I'm just a common reader, and whatever I read, I have read more about Amrapali and her connection to Buddha, and not much about Yashoda. I yeah. really, really want to read your book. Book is for sale. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I am. So why? This is my new agent. <laughs> you know, why is that? <sighs> That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know, and I really wonder, I think some character, maybe because Yashodara is, she's too close to the Buddha. We don't want that. It's and too intimate. It's, it's I think. Yeah, she, you, it's always a fear of intrusion into yeah. a holy space. Whereas Amrabali so. is such a romantic story yeah. that it lends itself to. It's like Maya. It, it's so intimate. He was inside her body. Nobody could be closer to the Buddha than her. No, I'm a, wait a minute. There's a question this. here. We get. Yes, hello? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say that what's really impressing uh, is that, uh, as Navita said, Hinduism itself was extremely hierarchical and patriarchal, as was Buddhism as a reform movement within Hinduism. And so it's been that way ever since. And it's only recently, for instance, there's this recent book by Sultrim Alioni called Women Rising. She wrote a book 20 years ago called Wisdom, Women of Wisdom, in which this um, feminine aspect, she calls it the Dakini aspect, enters into Buddhism. But the particular thing it's associated with is emotional processing, which is almost completely absent in even modern male Buddhist teachers. And so there's really not a mystery here that uh, this is not being told historically, because when I was in Tibet, I recall being with my guide, we went to the one nunnery that was on the you know, trail of the four big cities, and they had little flowers outside, and they had family pictures inside, and was kept in a very domestically uh, lovely way. And the guide said, when we got out, this is, I don't know, when it was this 2000 or 2001, whatever it was, uh, that, well, you know, these women can never be enlightened because they're in a female body. And they're just too indulgent. And you see all these family photographs and all this attachment to, you know, the relative world. And my brother, he is a monk. And so he has a chance. And this is just today. You know, this is not something that went on 1,500 years ago. This patriarchal uh, suppression of the feminine is only just beginning to stir uh, and come out within Buddhism. So thank you for focusing on this. I think it's really Indeed. a great contribution. We did the thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just... Go ahead. Did you want to respond? <laughs> Go ahead. I, well, I just... I, I, um, Do respond. Give your last word. Thank you, but... Um, I just think I would be careful of some of those assumptions. Uh, I I've had personal experience with male teachers that are rinpoches actually saying in my presence 20 yeah. years ago that you here who are studying, say, with folks are rinpoche, who are just householders, maybe someday in some incarnation you'll be fortunate enough to be a male monk. Now, this is in my lifetime. This is not an assumption. <laughs> No, no, I know. I've, I've, I've been told these things myself, and I've also been told it's a shame I was born Canadian. Um, <laughs> if only I had done better. Okay, so yes, these things exist. Patriarchy is real. There's, there's no question about the. I don't in any way want to... Uh, but I just... I, I don't, you want to go back to the Buddha's words, you mean? To the, no, the I, I just would be careful of uh, sweeping assumptions like that, because I think things are more complicated and nuanced it's it's sorry it's the academic in me that's answering but there's just, there i just by what you think of as assumptions and what i said that's that would be helpful okay I'm you're about historical okay i will use one example your argument that there's no emotional processing in buddhism I, okay, now I think oh, just what you like. We I would just I just Last can't even imagine that that's true. I think it just depends where you're going to categorize the emotion, but I think so much of Buddhist pro processing is about trying to understand the mind and how it functions and where it comes from and what is happening. 
Whether you call that emotion or mind, I think that's a technicality. At the end of the day, there is a profound commitment in Buddhism to process the inner experience and understand what it is. And the commitment to compassion. And, I, and to feminize that or masculinize it, I just think, I, I, would, I, would, just, I would just urge you to maybe, um, I understand what you're saying, that these, some of these like, personal anecdotal experiences are very real. It's very real that the Maha Pajapati was told that you will always be inferior to a man in ordination process. These things are real, and certainly you can imagine that as a diehard feminist as I am, I would in no way you know, welcome you know, patriarchal abuses, but I would be careful about how quickly I would generalize, is what I'm saying. Excellent. Thank you.